hopefully this will fit in nicely in between some of the things that Tom talked about and some of the things uh, that Patrick talked about. Um, but I really want to focus on the disks. And I don't just want to talk about uh, numerical simulations. I want to spend a lot of time talking about the sort of theory that's under, that we're trying to reproduce with the numerical simulations. So I'm going to walk through sort of some of the physics behind uh, accretion disk theory. Um, I'll start off with a very, very brief observational overview. Um, this will touch on some of the things that Tom was mentioning about disk lifetimes, just to give you a sense of what are the end stages, the protoplanetary disks that we can actually observe, uh, contrasting with what Patrick pointed out, the earlier stages, which are very challenging to observe. Um, and then I want to spend sort of the bulk of the time talking about viscous disk theory. So this is what's underlying many of our assumptions about how accretion disks work as what I like to call angular momentum transport machines. And then I'll spend some time talking about the different sources that we have for angular momentum transport, both the magnetorotational instability, uh, self-gravity, and I'll briefly touch on disk winds. Um, and I won't talk about the magnetic braking that Patrick was talking about because that's really happening on the larger scales. That's setting the initial conditions for these uh, accretion disks. And then at the very end, I think I'm going to skip off the disk phenomenology um, just due to time. And then I'll spend a little bit more time just reviewing the, some of these numerical techniques, which you may have already seen, but just to remind you of what we do uh, when we're specifically trying to understand uh, protostellar or protoplanetary accretion disks. So, what do we know about uh, protostellar or protoplanetary accretion disks? Well, we think they live maybe three to five mega years. And again, this is based on looking at star clusters that we think are young based on our somewhat uncertain models for pre main sequence stars, and then observing them in the infrared or in the submillimeter and asking what fraction of them have an infrared excess. What fraction of them do we not just see the stellar photosphere? But do we see something that looks like dust? And that's how we decide that there is a disk. At these stages, the typical sizes uh, physically are anywhere between 100 to 1,000 AU. Um, this is measured, again, both in submillimeter, where you're actually resolving the disk using interferometers, um, sometimes in scattered light. So if you've seen those Hubble proplids, where you have a disk that is illuminated by the background light, and then you see the disk shadow absorbing it. Um, and then also using the spectral energy distribution where we take a spectrum at different wavelengths and then based on the temperature of the dust grains infer the, uh, the radii of the disk. Um, we can also now um, compare the size of the disk with the velocity gradients observed in cores. And it, it seems like based on the net angular momentum in the core, these radii are not crazy. Uh, and as Patrick was saying, the observations are very uncertain for a lot of this. So I think the best we can hope for is to get things right to the order of magnitude level. You know, are things in the right general uh, vicinity? Uh, and th this is another thing that was sort of mentioned. I just want to emphasize that protostellar and protoplanetary accretion disks are mostly neutral and cold, less than a few hundred Kelvin, less than 100 Kelvin, less than 50 Kelvin in their outer parts. And so this is going to become very important when we start talking about uh, magnetization. Because recall that if you want something to be well magnetized, you need to have something that carries the field. You need to have separated uh, you know, ions uh, and electrons. In terms of masses, what we can measure thus far, um, anywhere between 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 of uh, the mass of the object, this, so of order you know, 0.01 solar masses. Um, these measurements are, again, very uncertain. The way that we derive these is by observing warm dust, uh, assuming dust to gas ratio, and then inferring a grain size distribution. Because the way that the grains uh, reflect light depends on how big they are, whether they're micron size, millimeter size, uh, centimeter size. And there are order of magnitude uncertainties, particularly in what you get out when you infer different grain size distributions. So again, there's a lot that we don't quite understand, but this is what we're working to reproduce at some level with our theories. So as I said, accretion disks, um, for our purposes, are really angular momentum transport machines. So they take all of the material that's funneled in from large scales. You have to get the angular momentum out in a small amount of the mass, 
so that most of the mass can drain in and form the central star. Um, we know that happens because we see the stars. So that part is clear. It's a question of how it works. Uh, the way that a lot of the early disk theory was done was by using the vertically integrated viscous fluid equations in the thin disk approximation. So this means that we're saying, okay, yes, everything's actually three-dimensional, but if I'm just thinking about the disk, everything's going to be in 2D, so I can just talk about surface densities, sigmas, and then I can just write down the same type of hydrodynamic equations that we talked about earlier in the week. So I have mass conservation, momentum conservation, and then um, in this case, I haven't put in an energy equation because you can, uh, you can choose, say, an adiabatic equation of state or an isothermal equation of state. That's sort of a separate issue. Uh, but then the key thing here is this integrated viscous tensor. So this is, our, uh, this is where we're sort of putting all of our ignorance. We're saying, OK, we know that as I advect mass, I have to conserve mass. As I advect momentum and torque it, I have to conserve it. And then all of the action is happening through this anomalous viscosity. We're saying, I don't really know what's transporting a momentum. I'm just going to pretend that I can represent it through this tensor and put all my uncertainty in this new parameter. And I'll speak a little bit more about where that comes from. And so for a lot of the early disk literature, we basically combine these three equations to get a diffusion equation. And this tells us how, under the influence of uh, viscosity and source terms for angular momentum or source, source term, terms for mass, how, a, how this system will evolve. So this is you know, basically the same way you would describe the movement of honey if I poured it on this table based on some, or water or any other fluid. So I think there's a couple important things to think about. The first is why do we even talk about viscosity when we're trying to understand angular momentum transport? And I, I don't think this is, this is obvious. And so I'm going to do something very dangerous right now and I'm going to purposely confuse you. So, I apologize in advance, but I, I, I found this to be a useful exercise to go through myself, so uh, I hope you will uh, feel the same. So the reason we talk about viscosity is it transports momentum orthogonal to a shear flow. So if I imagine some reference uh, height z, and I have a, flow, a, a field, a, a velocity field where it's moving slower down here and faster up here, uh, and I, I exchange fluid particles across this boundary, I will get a net exchange in angular momentum because the velocity down here is different than the velocity up here. And so you can uh, work out what the net change in angular momentum is if I switch these two parcels and you find that viscosity works to remove the shear. It's going to try to make this flow all the same. Right, this is what you know naturally. Like if I put a, if I put a record down on a record player and poured a viscous fluid on top of it, it would slow down the movement of the record relative to the source. So that's exactly what viscosity does. And in this context, it's very, it's very easy to see why maybe viscosity would transport angular momentum outward. But now let's look at a Keplerian flow a little bit more carefully and sort of naively exchange the z in that first diagram for radius in a Keplerian disk. So right, if I, if I put myself at some location in a Keplerian disk, on one side of me, flow is going to move in one direction. The other side is going to move in the other direction. So that's this, just this change that you're making here. Um, and if I play the exact same game, and I exchange two fluid parcels from the interior of the disk and the exterior of the disk, right? you know that the velocity is higher interior than exterior. So if I just exchange those two parcels and preserve the uh, fluid velocity, I will also get transport of angular momentum outward. I'm moving more rapidly uh, moving material outward. So again, momentum is, propor is proportional to velocity, so you get an exchange of angular momentum outward. But the thing that's a little tricky about that is when I was looking at this diagram here and I said I want to exchange these fluid parcels and pre preserve their velocity, I was also naturally preserving their linear momentum. But if instead I'm talking about the Keplerian disk, it's not the same thing to conserve velocity as I exchange those fluid particles and exchange angular momentum, which is what we're concerned with, right? It's not obvious that if I switch two fluid particles, they should keep their angular velocity rather than their angular momentum. So if I were to preserve their angular uh, momentum across that surface, 
I would get the opposite sign. I would get that angular momentum goes in. So as I said, I apologize. You should be confused. This is sort of one of, I think, the big problems with a lot of our uh, accretionist theories is that this analogy is, is it's not so good uh, because you can, it, it's not obvious that viscosity should transport angular, mount, uh, angular momentum outwards. And so for, for a long time, people uh, sort of argued about this because this, this switch from the normal shear flow to a Keplerian flow doesn't preserve what you think about how viscosity transports angular momentum. Now, in either case, you're going to be removing shear. And one of the ways I like to think about it, uh, and, and one of the ways you can maybe convince yourself that the angular momentum going out is the right answer, is that it's sort of sapping energy from the system. The, the gravitational potential of the star is trying to reinforce this shear, and uh, you need to remove energy from the system, which means angular momentum is going outwards and material is going inwards. That's the, that's the direction in which you're uh, uh, doing, yeah, in which energy is flowing in the right direction. But again, It's, uh, I understand it's a bit confusing. So it's a little silly if I ask you now if you're confused and have any questions. But before I move on, do you have any questions? OK, so it's all very clear to you. Great. I'm glad. Does anyone else in the room, like Patrick or Tom, want to uh, challenge or contradict or add anything to the discussion? Well, yeah, just, that's not how it works. I mean, yeah. Right, you think about. viscosity doing work on the particles, and then all of a sudden the picture changes. Right, and so there's a, there's a there's an entire there's a, I think there's a nicer analogy in the particle case. So for um, so like Greenberg 1988 has a really nice explanation of it when you're talking about um, collisional flu, collisional flows. Um, but um, yeah. but just thinking about uh, I'm trying to think of other analogies that don't work. Uh, there there is I think it was a uh, Analogy by Alfane, actually. Mm -hmm. What happens if you have a bunch of apples in a, in a oh, I'm not familiar with this. Okay. In a, in a um, spacecraft, and under, you know, do, the, do the apples collide together and go into a plane, or do they spread across the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the available volume, you know, in, in a continuum limit? Of course, the spread of viscosity. If you start to think about individual collisions, you'd think they'd end up in a plane. So. Another confusing analogy for you. Yeah, and so, as I said in my in my uh, secondary analogy, this was the bad. Yeah. Um, so making things worse, uh, despite the fact that I I said, well, it's a little confusing to apply this viscous analogy in general. Uh, what's even worse is that, of course, uh, the molecular viscosity in protostellar disks is tiny. So uh, you can you can calculate that for. Um, you can calculate the Reynolds number in a typical uh, protostellar accretion disk. So uh, for a star of about a solar mass, temperature of 400 Kelvin, uh, reasonable surface density at a distance of 1 AU, um, the Reynolds number of the flow is 10 to the 14. So molecular viscosity, which is the thing we're sort of familiar with on Earth, is totally irrelevant. Um, and so what we actually typically are talking about is that, well, OK, a high Reynolds flow is turbulent, and if I redo this calculation where I replace the sound speed with the turbulent velocity and then more importantly the length scale instead of having to do with molecular viscosity it has to do with some eddy turnover length then I can get something that actually has a reasonable magnitude and this is where the Shakura Sunyai of effective viscosity comes from where we say okay uh, instead of having my viscosity be proportional to something having to do with interactions between molecules it's proportional to some unknown number times the sound speed in the disk, which is the, uh, which is going to be comparable to the turbulent velocity, and then some length scale, which I'm going to say that the turnover, the, the sort of largest scale eddy I can have in my disk is basically going to be proportional to the scale height. And so you'll sometimes see it written like this. And if I go back to my uh, viscous tensor that I showed you a couple slides ago, and you rewrite this in terms of this alpha prescription, then you just have a uh, some number that you don't know the answer, that's uncertain, surface density, sound speed, and then this is just your shear. And so this is why this is a very convenient way to talk about angular momentum transport dis despite all of the deficiencies, because I can put all of my ignorance in just one unknown. 
but of course, um, as you might expect, if I put all my ignorance in one number, this really is going to oversimplify the problem. Because I, now I can't talk about necessarily how some uh, physical mechanism for generating angular momentum transport will scale. I can't talk, you know, it's not necessarily going to be constant throughout the disks. Um, not every transport mechanism that you come up with will correlate with the local pressure, which is what you get with this viscous tension. You get this correlation with the pressure. Um, but despite all that, you know, there are numerical models that show that it works well in many cases. Um, but something that Tom spent a lot of time talking about today, and I think is really important, and it's really sort of reminds us why we have to be careful when we are uh, setting up our, our numerical schemes, is that this numerical diff diffusivity also acts like a viscosity. And so, you know, when we're trying to simulate a protostellar accretion disk, and say we're putting in some physics and asking, well, how does it transport angular momentum? There's always this balance between measuring the contributions from the physics that we've put in and the contributions from the viscosity. And this is sort of lies at the root of why we've had so much trouble understanding the problem of disk fragmentation, because you are fundamentally have two things competing with each other. You have your numerical effects and your physical effects. They're both acting in some ways like a viscosity, and it can be challenging to separate the two of them out. So what actually transports angular momentum? So uh, if it's not this, you know, what stands in for the anomalous viscosity? So the sort of simplest answer is that it's positive correlations between radial and azimuthal uh, velocities. And Maxwell stresses um, when you add in magnetic fields. So you have the, if you rewrite out the viscous tensor, right, you have this positive correlation in Vr and V phi, and then you have the equivalent for the Maxwell stresses due to your magnetic field. And again, that's just what we're representing by that nu or an alpha. Um, so again, a priori, it's not clear why a microscopic process should produce these correlations. Um, but again, it's this idea that these positive velocity correlations are, are what extract energy from the disk shear, and that's what's going to cause the material to go in. So as we've been talking about all week, right, because these things are hard to understand analytically, it's great to do you know, real high resolution numerical experiments where we simulate the physical processes and then just measure their, their angular momentum transport. But I've shown a simulation that I've done, and I just want to you know, warn that even after we go to all the trouble of running a real numerical simulation and measuring the velocities, we then go put plots like this in our paper where we plot everything in terms of this alpha, this uh, ignorance parameter. And we do that because, again, it's just very convenient to make comparisons between codes and between observations by using this, this ignorance parameter. But so I'm, I, I'm admitting here that even as somebody who wants to do this right and tries to do numerical experiments to understanding the transport, I still end up plotting things in terms of this bad ignorance parameter. You, you might also point out that the right, numerical Totally yes, that's right. So this is, so this is, and but you know, and this is one of the reasons why we we made this plot. Mark is Mark is on this paper, um, where uh, where this is. Yeah. So this is the this is the numerical line, and this is one thing that I think is very important to do any time you're doing a numerical experiment, trying to measure a physical source of an effective viscosity of angular momentum transport. You have to compare the magnitude of the terms that you're getting from the physics in your simulation with the magnitude that you're getting out from the numerics. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but particularly in the problem of disk fragmentation, as Tom so nicely showed, the viscosity is contributing not just in terms of angular momentum transport, but in terms of heating. And so it can be really, really fundamental in trying to understand uh, the sort of physical nature of your, of your simulation. So that plot uh, comes from a simulation that Mark did uh, with the same code where you measure the accretion rate uh, as a function of radius. So you measure the rate at which you're basically producing radial velocity. And that tells you how much angular momentum you're losing. And you can convert that into an alpha. So the setup was, was basically identical. You start with a, you know, you have a laminar disk. So that should, so you're, it's basically going to be proportional to how you're invecting the fluid across the flow, uh, across the grid. Um, it's the same setup that you set up a stable disk as opposed to an unstable. 
Exactly. And then just watch as it starts numerically draining into the center. Yeah, so it's true that once you add in turbulence, you are, cha you are changing the sort of um, geometry of the flow. It's not all azimuthal initially. But in a, but in a, well, I would say in a Cartesian grid, again, sort of going back to what I talked about yesterday, you don't have a preferred axis of symmetry. And so it's not obvious that you should get more diffusion by uh, crossing your grid in one, you know, directly in as the azimuthal direction and the radial direction. People have done this, tried to do it in um, cylindrical codes. And there you actually do have a sort of a questionable uh, situation when you try to compare a laminar to a non-laminar flow because the diffusion when your disk is laminar is going to be very, very much less than it is when the disk is not laminar because you're crossing the, your, your fluxes are really increasing across the boundary. So that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so yes, alpha is very big. So it's very big in the interior because this is dominated by numerics. And then this is a strongly, this is a very massive self-gravitating disk. And so you're generating very large alphas. So I, the, uh, I didn't want to talk about the details of the simulation, merely just admit that we do things badly sometimes. But that's because it's sort of the easiest way to, uh, to make comparisons. So what are the actual sources of angular momentum transport? Um, I sort of outlined these at the beginning. So I'll go through the MRI briefly. Uh, disk self-gravity, both the contributions from spiral arms and from gravito turbulence. I will mention disk winds. I will not mention convection and hydrodynamic turbulence, both of which have been argued to transport angular momentum by some authors and not by others. Um, if anyone else in the room wants to contribute on those two topics, that would be uh, great. But it's uh, with the convection, I would say people disagree on which direction it transports angular momentum. With the hydrodynamic turbulence, uh, sort of distinct from uh, gravito turbulence where it's driven by self-gravity in the disk. It's not clear what the source is, although people have ar argued that maybe you generate vortices um, and those can act to generate hydrodynamic turbulence. So the magnetorotational instability of the MRI, I mean, many of you have probably seen this, so I'll just go through it quickly for those who haven't. So this is a weak field instability, so if you have a disk that is threaded by a vertical a magnetic field and you perturb a fluid element outward in radius, um, basically the magnetic tension accelerates the fluid element which increases its angular momentum and that causes it to try to continue to move outward which further stresses the field line and so you can see how this is a runaway effect that's going to lead towards outward transport of angular momentum. Now I should point out this works in the ideal MHD limit where the field is um, uh, exactly frozen in with the fluid um, and the only sort of stability criterion, you have to have a relatively weak field, and then you just have to have a velocity, uh, azimuth velocity, velocity gradient that um, decreases outwards. So that's basically a Keplerian flow. If you were to reverse the direction of your flow, you would not be unstable. This is sort of the same thing as the, uh, similar to the, the Rayleigh criterion, if that's something that you're familiar with. So, um, as Patrick started to talk about in the end of his talk, there are some complications associated with magnetic effects in general in protostellar disks because they are not fully ionized fluids like you have when you're talking about, say, compact objects. They're cold and neutral. And the ionization fraction, say, due to cosmic rays alone, is very, very small. So most of the disk is not ionized. There are other sources of ionization, maybe the central star, x-rays from the central star, um, from other stars in the area, and I, I don't want to talk about that in detail um, because it depends both on the sources of the ionization and also on the properties of your dust grains. Um, there's a lot of chemistry uh, that can affect how much, how much ionization you get per ionizing photon, so to speak. Um, but what this, what this leads to is a couple different um, sort of non-ideal effects that we need to take into account when we're thinking about magnetized protostellar accretion disks. The first that I think is sort of one of the more important is the idea of layered accretion and dead zones. And I think Tom maybe mentioned this brief, briefly. So this, um, I think it originally comes from a paper by uh, Charles Gamby in 96, where he pointed out that if you have ionization uh, coming in from, say, cosmic rays or from the central star, you'll penetrate only a certain skin depth into your disk. And so you'll have layers 
at the outer edges of your disk that are active and ionized and can support the magnetorotational instability. And then you'll have what's a, a so-called dead zone in the middle where you cannot ionize the disk and it will not be uh, MRI active. And so a lot of work is being done right now trying to think about how this sandwiching can aid planet formation by sort of uh, decreasing the turbulence within this so-called dead zone. Um, there's other non-ideal MHD effects. There's omic dissipation, ambipolar diffusion, um, where the field actually sort of leaks out because it's, uh, because it's not well coupled to the neutrals. Um, and you can sort of uh, work out the different regimes where these effects dominate um, based on the relative uh, pressure in the gas and the magnetic field. So this is just a plot from um, Juning Bai and Jim Stone showing that there are these different regimes where the MRI is prohibited or permitted and the effective alpha you get out in terms of uh, transport, uh, you know, angular momentum transport depends strongly on that. So I think Jim's, Jim will probably talk about this more uh, later on. This is, this is work that's being done actively in Athena. So I'll briefly talk about disk self-gravity. Um, this, is, this is something that was sort of implicitly mentioned uh, by Tom when he was talking about fragmentation. So uh, obviously if you have a uh, protostellar disk that has a significant amount of mass, you get uh, competition between the uh, self-gravity in the vertical direction, pressure, which is stabilizing you in the vertical direction, and then you have this shear component um, from the, the stellar potential. And we characterize the strength of self-gravity by tomb rays Q, which compares these forces. And when it gets small enough, somewhere in the vicinity of one, although exactly where uh, is unclear, you can get to the sort of end state of fragmentation, but at uh, sort of intermediate values, or maybe depending on the thermodynamic properties of the disk, you don't always saturate, and you don't always get fragmentation. You can get the spiral arms that, uh, that you saw in many of Tom's movies, or you can get this sort of smaller scale turbulence. And whether you get these sort of global spiral modes or the small scale turbulence uh, probably depends to some extent on the sort of length scales or of the instability that you can support in your disk. Typically, the thicker the disk is, the better you are at supporting these global spiral modes. And the thinner the disk is, uh, the more you transition into these, uh, tur these turbulent modes. And I'll show you the turbulent ones in a bit. I'll just briefly uh, remind you why these spiral arms actually transport angular momentum. Um, so it's, again, the same idea that they can, uh, they, they act in some ways like a Maxwell stress in that they can generate these positive correlations between uh, something like VR and V phi, except in this case it's the sort of gravitational acceleration. And the reason that you always see these uh, trailing spiral arms formed is because those are the ones that generate the positive correlations between VR and V phi by attracting the material to the over density in the trailing spiral arm. If you switch these around, you don't get positive angular momentum transport. Um, you, can, you can derive how this actually transports angular momentum um, by conserving wave actions as wave cross, waves cross the co-rotation region with this spiral pattern. Um, and of course, we go ahead and turn that into an alpha, which I've argued is bad, but again, it's just convenient to do it that way. Um, if you go to the other limit, where instead of having these global spiral arms, you get small scale turbulence, that can also drive angular momentum transport. Remember, this is what we said, the MRI effectively can drive turbulence. Um, and the viscosity, when we made that substitution to get the alpha parameterization, we were talking about how turbulence can transport angular momentum. So this is actually uh, these early uh, fragmentation simulations that, that Tom was talking about from Charles Gammy. And the idea is that if you don't cross that threshold towards fragmentation because the heating is too strong, you sort of try to fragment, but then you heat up. You try to fragment, then you heat up. And that's generating these fluctuations that give you this turbulent density and velocity field. And um, where this, this whole cooling time scale comes from is by balancing the viscous dissipation with the radiative cooling. And so you were asking you sort of how, this is how you can analytically begin to derive uh, an expected value for the critical cooling rate by requiring, you know, by asking when, when will these two things not be, uh, not be in balance. And so what, what Charles Gammy first worked out is that you can get a steady state by balancing the 
uh, effective angular momentum transport rate. So this is how much. Uh, this is like a way to quantify how much turbulence you're getting from your gravitational instabilities with this cooling time here. Um, again, this is that same thing that Tom variously, varyingly called beta or C depending on the literature, which is a mess on this subject. Um, but so I just really want to emphasize this is why you have to really worry about your artificial uh, viscosity prescriptions or your numerical viscosity in the code. It's because understanding the transition from a state that looks like this to the fragmenting state that, that Tom was talking about, it depends on this viscous dissipation. It depends on how you heat up the disk. And you heat up the disk both physically due to, due to basically PDV work from the compression you generate. And so that, that's where the dependence on the adiabatic index comes in, because the stiffer the equation of state, the more heat you generate that way. But you also get it from these viscous, from viscous effects from your actual grid or your numerical scheme. And so understanding in, in gory, gory detail how these different things contribute is really, really important for understanding the physics. So you know, I, that's why I think it's, 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 it's really good that, especially at a workshop like this, we really emphasize the connection between the physical sources of heating and the numerical sources of heating or errors in our code. So if we look at a plot of uh, the self-gravity, strength of self-gravity in the disk Q versus the mass ratio between the disk and the star, you can actually plot sort of in what regimes you expect different forms of angular momentum transport to dominate. And what you see is that for a wide swath of, of disks, so anytime Q is sort of above a little bit over one, and even for relatively massive disks, the MRI is probably the more important generator of uh, angular momentum transport. But you do have this very special regime at the bottom where gravitational instability um, might be important. And I should say the, the means to make these estimates is, is somewhat uncertain. So the last transport mechanism I want to talk about um, is disk winds. And this is something that I think uh, really connects up when we start thinking about the global field geometry in our core, where you've started to drag in a field as you're trying to form your protostellar disk. Because uh, unlike the MRI, which doesn't really care about what's going on above or below the disk midplane, it really is a sort of local instability, um, disk winds are more are sort of on a global scale. And the idea is that if you have a, a field that's threading the disk, if the field is sufficiently inclined, uh, with respect to the disk midplane, it can act like a lever arm, and you can launch material along the magnetic field, transport it out to large radii, and this acts as a means of transporting angular momentum. Uh, it requires, as I said, a sort of large, well large-scale, well-coupled field, um, and there are still uncertainties about uh, where it arises from. And, and again, I don't know if Jim is going to mention this. He's been doing some work on this very recently about ways that maybe the MRI and disk winds can compete with one another um, in the same system. So I just want to spend a few, few minutes at the end of the talk uh, just emphasizing what are the different numerical methods that people use to study disks. Um, Mark, how much time do I have? I, I'll end at 12.30. Huh? I mean, I can end at 12.30, so. Oh, if you want to end at 12.30, well, it's 12.20 now, so you have 10 minutes. But we didn't start until 11.45. OK, well, I, I, I planned for that. I expected that. So um, there's sort of increasing in level of complexity. There's, there's four different methods. So viscous models, these are 1D. Shearing sheets are 2D. Shearing boxes are 3D. And of course, global models are, in some ways, the best. But you have to balance uh, what kind of uh, experiment you're trying to do. So if I want to do something in sort of a, a way that brushes over a lot of physics, but uh, covers a wide parameter space, I want to be able to run my code many, many different times for a really long time. So I might choose 1D viscous models. If I want to study a process in sort of gory, gory detail at very, very high resolution, but give up on some of the three-dimensional aspects of physics, shearing sheets are great. Um, shearing boxes are better, but now in 3D, you're going to have to sacrifice resolution. And then 3D global models are really what we're always going to be aiming for, but then you have so much computational expense that you necessarily give up on resolution and time scale. <laughs>
So for the 1D viscous models, this goes back to that sort of very first slide where I talked about using just the single diffusion equation. And so you can couple the diffusion equation with your favorite energy equation, um, putting in a prescription for your viscosity. So now we've, again, totally neglected physics. Um, but again, you can do a really wide parameter study. So this is uh, some work by Zhao Anju, who, had, who was trying to understand the coupling between uh, gravitational instability in the outer disk and MRI in the inner disk. And he basically came up with different prescriptions saying, OK, alpha from MRI should look like this. Alpha from gravitational instability should look like this. What does the structure of my disk look like, just sort of averaged in radius, as I change these various parameters? And so this is the kind of simulation that's really much, or calculation, maybe I should say, that's really only possible to do for many, many dynamical times and many, many different parameters if you make these gross, simu gross uh, simplifications, but they can be very valuable. You can think of this as sort of intermediate between doing the pen and paper analytic calculations that tell us the order of magnitude. This is one step up from that where you're including a little bit more physics, but you're certainly not resolving your modes of momentum transport. So I, I gather you sort of talked about shearing sheets a little bit. OK, so uh, the idea of a shearing. I didn't really talk about OK, so. Uh, these are the, equation, the equations of the shearing sheet. The idea is that you are simulating a local 2D patch in your Keplerian disk, and it is co-rotating with the disk. So we've sort of boosted into the frame of the center of the box. So I have material on, in, on one side of me going one way, the other side going the other way. Um, and then I put in a Coriolis force to account for the fact that I've boosted into the rotating reference frame. Uh, the, a couple key things to keep in mind is that you are assuming that there is no curvature. So you're ignoring the fact that streamlines in the disk are curved with respect to this box. And so no matter how big you make this box, you're always going to be in that limit. And so um, even though you might want to try to capture sort of larger scale modes by increasing the size of your box, you're fundamentally limited by this uh, no curvature approximation. Uh, the other thing that's typically done in shearing sheet calculations is, is we use what's called shear periodic boundary conditions. And so what that means is um, material leaves the box here and then re-enters boosted by the same shear in the disk on the other side. So it's periodic uh, in the phi direction, in the, in the, sorry, in the radial direction. So material that exits the box here reappears on the other side. So this is convenient in the sense that it lets you uh, sort of simulate a continuing flow. You never lose material from your domain, but it also means that there's sort of an unphysical causal connection between what happens on the inside of the box and the outside of the box. So this is sort of a, a very powerful technique, both for, uh, this was used by Charles Gamme to simulate um, gravitational instability in 2D. It's also been used for MRI. Um, Just a quick, quick question. Yeah. You mentioned the no curvature. If you were to use one of these moving mesh codes, you would be able to put in the curvature of the boundary. Um, it's not the curvature of the boundary. It's that you, you there's no curvature in the. Uh, so you're you're tr you're changing r and phi for x and y, and you're not allowing. Uh, any curvature across across your box, so it's not that the G, it's not that the grid isn't curved. It's that your equations of motion don't account properly for the curvature. Does that make sense? It, it's that you're, you're equating, you've expanded to first order. In the yeah, equation. You're, you're dropping second order to higher. Yeah. When you write down those equations, those are not the exact equations. Those are the linearized equations. Okay. And so it, it's it's the equations themselves. That right. It's matter. it's not a question of the jump. Why don't we use the full equations? Because it's, it's an approximation. It's a, it's a, that, that's sort of the power of the approximation. Yeah, because, because at that point, why would you then bother doing it, doing the sharing box at all? Right at that point, if you're going to solve the full equations, why do you share a box at all? Like, you might as well, then you'd just be doing yeah, a, like a pi shape of your box. disk. Yeah. yeah. So, but what you get out of this is the ability to go to very, very high resolution in a tiny patch of the disk. And the approximation is valid when curvature is not important. So when that box is small compared to the radius of curvature that you're interested in. That's, yes. 
so it's also it's also easier to it's an easier code to write I guess is another good way of saying it um, so shearing box is trivially different it's just adding a vertical component um, but now again sort of going back to these issues of you know curvature and the validity of the approximation now you have to worry about the sort of height of your disk or the height of your box compared to the uh, X and Y or the uh, you know equivalent of the R and Phi. Um, the, the real advantage of going to a shearing box as opposed to a shearing sheet is that you know all of these instabilities are really fundamentally three-dimensional and so you at least get to keep that part um, that part of the physics uh, in your model. So I'll just show you a nice movie of what one of these uh, things looks like. This is courtesy of uh, Jake Simon, who's been doing a lot of work on understanding both the limitations of shearing boxes and sort of the details of the MRI in various limits. And so here you can see this box is sort of meant to represent this little patch of the disk. And you can see what the magnetic field looks like generated by the MRI and before you were looking at the density field. Um, and I think if you look at the top of the box, you can sort of get this idea of how material is flowing out at one end and re-entering. Um, I should point out that there's a uh, unfortunate, uh, what's the word, um, optical illusion where it looks like, uh, it looks like material is actually sort of converging in the center of the box and that's not actually happening. So I just want to, it's an important thing that's, the material is actually flowing in one direction. Another thing to keep in mind with uh, shearing boxes and shearing sheets is that there's, there's no inwards and outwards um, in the sense that there's, there's no preferred direction because of the way you write down the equations of motion. So that effect that you're seeing there, that's not actually material converging towards the center of the box. Yeah. This one does not have self-gravity. He has started to put it in and he's been doing, um, uh, you can see it's vertically stratified. So there's a net Gravita there's a there is gravity there is external and the and the box is stratified and that actually the combination of a stratification in the box and a net magnetic field a net vertical flux has been very important in actually getting MRI simulations to converge. So obviously the sort of best thing you could do is a full global disk or as you're seeing. Um, with what uh, some of the simulations that Patrick has been showing is not just the global three-dimensional disk, but the global three-dimensional disk embedded in the background so that you can self-consistently generate initial conditions and the disk at the center at the same time. Um, but this is really, really challenging because uh, you can't resolve the same physical scales if you're simulating the whole box versus simulating a little tiny patch of the disk. So it's still very difficult to do a global MRI simulation that adequately resolves the sort of small scales of the MRI. Um, similarly, uh, one of the things that uh, you know Patrick was sort of uh, mentioning is that the way that material feeds onto the disk is very important for both how you define the disk and determining the accretion properties of the disk, how material flows in, how our angular momentum transport machine works. And so there's this trade-off between being able to simulate how the material is coming onto the disk and being able to accurately simulate how the material is moving through the disk. And so, you know, it, it, is, it is still really valuable. You know, I think maybe we tend to get lazy and think, oh, well, computers have gotten so much better and so much faster. We can do the problem as we like. We don't have to worry about making our codes really, really efficient. But we're still so far away from being able to do the full problem uh, well enough that you know, working on getting these things to work as efficiently as possible and really paying attention to how our codes work on different uh, clusters based on the, you know, the way that things are configured, how much memory we have per node, how many CPUs per node is really, really important in trying to um, get at this problem. So I'll just put up my conclusions and say that you know, viscous disks are convenient. It's really nice to talk about alpha viscosities, but we should really be careful when we apply this and try to interpret physics based on a single parameter of ignorance. Um, based on the current observations and our current best guesses for the theory, um, the MRI uh, and gravitational instability, not necessarily fragmentation, um, are likely very important for transporting angular momentum depending on the type of disk you're talking about. 
Uh, disk winds are something that are, I think, still very interesting. It's just both harder to measure uh, observationally and harder to model because you're inherently relying on these global methods to do wind simulations. Um, uh, again, you know, this is a numerically based course. All of these processes are inherently nonlinear phenomena, which is why we don't just write down linear equations and say we've understood everything. And so it's hopefully a combination of both these uh, you know, nonlinear numerical simulations or numerical experiments done very, very carefully combined with observations that's going to be our best hope at understanding these. And I'm particularly excited because um, you know, all my observations are actually coming in now. So we can actually resolve these early stages in the class zero phase and, and, and actually see what we're trying to compare with. Um, and I'll just point out at the very end that so far I, was only, I only really talked about um, gas fluid dynamics. I didn't mention particles at all. There are a lot of effects that are probably very important for the actual planet formation process that have to do with how the, the particles, you know, these rocks interact with the gas. And I haven't mentioned them at all, and I apologize. So I'm just going to finish up there, and uh, if you have any other questions, thanks.